War. War never changes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Fallout 3. My name's Camel, and today we will be taking a look at all of the Easter eggs that can be found within the game. At least that I could find. We'll also just be covering the Easter eggs in the base game, meaning nothing from the DLCs will be included in this video. Timestamps for each of the Easter eggs can be found down in the description along with links to my social media and to my other Easter egg videos. I'm sure at some point I'll mispronounce something or get something wrong, so apologies for that. And just so people know, an Easter egg is an unexpected or undocumented feature in a video game or a movie or something like that, added as a joke or bonus. So while Easter eggs often are references to things, say in pop culture, by definition they do not have to be. And before we kick off, just a friendly spoiler warning, if you haven't played Fallout 3 yet, I'm sure this video will prompt you to do so. So kick back, relax, grab a new Coca-Cola, and let's get into the many Easter eggs of Fallout 3. So firstly, while these can be found throughout the wasteland, let's go back to Vault 101 just to, you know, start off nice and easy and at home. So throughout the capital wasteland, several security cameras can be found mounted onto walls. While they already do look quite suspicious, if we take a look at the red eye in the center of each, it's clear they modeled these after HAL 9000, the main computer of the Discovery 1 from Stanley Kubrick's 1968 movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. If you've seen it, you know how's creepy as, so please feel free to smash these security cameras and remember to fear AI. Now the 1969 book and the then 1975 movie A Boy and His Dog influenced Fallout as a whole, but in the case of this video, specifically Fallout 3, in many ways. Set in a dystopian, post-apocalyptic America, the main character, Vic, the boy, has a telepathic pet-slash-companion dog called Blood. On rare occasion, Vic will refer to his pet dog as Dog Meat. Of course, this is where the name for Dog Meat in Fallout comes from. In this universe, there are also entities referred to as Screamers. We never actually get to see one, but they are greatly feared, and in one scene, a Screamer approaches Vic and his dog Blood, and as it does, a great green glow lights up the room and is emitted from the Screamer. This is, of course, where the concept of glowing ones in Fallout 3 came from. Also, in A Boy and His Dog, there are these creepy underground societies that survive in what could be described as underground vaults. They also have very strange and creepy strict rules and societal hierarchies, where strange and eerily perfect community traits are displayed which of course has influenced the concept of vaults within Fallout 3. And finally in Oasis, Harold refers to the tree he is trapped within as Herbert. He kept growing around me. Maybe for calling him Herbert all the time. His name's really Bob. I think it's funny when I call him Herbert though. <laughs> But in A Boy and His Dog, the pet dog Blood often calls the boy Vic Albert because it annoys him. And the dog finds it funny, just as Harold finds it funny to call the tree Herbert. Ah uh, yes, now the perk The Devil's Highway is of course a reference and play on words to the ACDC song Highway to Hell. And in a similar fashion, the perk Escalator to Heaven is a reference to the Pink Floyd song Stairway to Heaven. So scribe Elizabeth Jemson can sometimes be heard saying this. If we value the pursuit of knowledge, we must be free to follow wherever that search may lead us. I found that in an ancient book. The words of wisdom of one of the greatest men of the former civilization. Now this is actually a quote made by the US diplomat and democratic politician Adlai E. Stevenson Jr. during his speech at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in October 1952. Now there are two characters, Alastair Tenpenny and his arch nemesis, Mr. Crowley. Now their names combined make Alastair Crowley who was a famed British occultist who explored all realms of human pleasure and delved particularly into taboo delights. 
He was also often referred to as the wickedest man alive and a Satanist, but fittingly, Alistair Tenpenny could be considered wicked, and Mr. Crowley resides in a location aptly named Underworld, so with their powers combined, they do make a good reference to Alistair Crowley. At the top of the Statesman Hotel, we can find a mercenary named Brick, who lives up to her name. She's got short hair, an attitude, she's muscly, and intimidating in appearance. She carries a pistol and her unique minigun she has named Eugene. Now, Brick here is based off of a character from the 1986 sci-fi horror film Aliens, in which there is one Marine Vasquez, a muscle-bound, fierce, short-haired, intimidating lady who carries a pistol and her heavy-duty smart gun, which has Adios written on the side, much like how Brick has customized her personalized heavy-duty gun, Eugene. Every now and then, you'll catch a Mr. Gutsy dropping this line. There's nothing I like better than the smell of plasma in the morning. This is of course referencing the famous line, There's nothing I like better than the smell of napalm in the morning. Delivered by Lieutenant Colonel William Bill Kilgore in the 1979 epic war film Apocalypse Now. The ever so friendly ghoul Sharon will occasionally say this. If that is what you wish then it is what I shall do. I must say that I find happiness in a warm gun. This line that he finds happiness in a warm gun alludes to a song written by the Beatles called Happiness is a Warm Gun, which was released in 1968. I'm sure we've all used the fat man at least a few times, probably many times, but did you know after firing the fat man, you have to reload it, and when it's reloaded, you'll hear a bell. This bell, the actual audio of the bell we hear in game, is a recording of the lunch bell at Bethesda's headquarters in real life. Hmm, talk about an explosive meal. In Megaton, there is an undetonated nuclear bomb, which is religiously idolized by a faction known as the Children of Atom. This whole setup is based off of a similar plotline in the 1970 film Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which is also set in a dystopian future, and there is a cult who worship an ancient and undetonated nuclear bomb, just like we see here in Fallout 3. Now for those players who have a very keen eye and noticed the date on the Pip-Boy during the game's introduction on your birthday, we'll see that our character the Lone Wanderer was born on July the 13th. Now this date, 7 13, is actually a reference to the biblical verse Micah 7 13, which reads, And the earth will become desolate because of her inhabitants on account of the fruit of their deeds. Essentially, humanity will destroy itself with its own creations, which is of course exactly what the entire concept of Fallout is based upon. So even the character's birth date is a reference to the post-apocalyptic theme. Now if you've ever been to Paradise Falls, or ever been near it, no doubt you've noticed the towering, cheerful young chap, the giant ice cream boy statue. Well, if you've ever thought it looked familiar, here's why. This here statue in Fallout 3 is based off of the Big Boy restaurant chain in real life, famous for having these jolly caricatures as their mascot. Ironically, Paradise Falls is quite the opposite of jolly. And also here at Paradise Falls, there is a rather unique looking giant starburst statue. This has been based off of the sign for the now defunct satellite shopland in Anaheim, California, which is now just a fallen star. Now the name of the quest and achievement, Big Trouble in Big Town, is a reference to the 1986 film Big Trouble in Little China. Along the same lines, there is also a quest called A Nice Day for a Right Wedding, which might sound familiar to you. And if it does, that's because the quest name is a play on the lyric from the Billy Idol song White Wedding. That lyric being, it's a nice day for a white wedding. But in Fallout's case, it's a nice day for a right wedding. Ah yes, now inside the Museum of Technology, we can find a plaque on the wall. Here is described the sad fate 
of the USS Eben Atoll. It was a ship, a missile destroyer, that was torpedoed accidentally by a friendly US submarine, the USS Interference. Now the name of the ship, Eben Atoll, can be translated to Black Isle, as Eben is short for ebony, which is often used to describe black, and an atoll is similar to an island or an isle. So Eben Atoll, Black Isle. Now the Black Isle was sunk by the USS Interference. So what does this mean? Well, Black Isle Studios was actually responsible for making Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. However, Black Isle Studios was shut down by their parent company, Interplay. Much like how the Eben Atoll was torpedoed and destroyed by a friendly submarine, the USS Interference, or in this case, Interplay. A very subtle but pretty funny poke at the whole Interplay Black Isle Studios shutdown. Okay, so The Quest of the Replicated Man is a nod to the 1982 film Blade Runner. It's a reference in name, content, theme, and The Replicated Man is based on, of course, The Replicants from Blade Runner. And we know now that The Replicated Man was a gateway into the concept of the Institute and the Synths, which of course we experienced in Fallout 4. Now the super mutant Forks also says this line. Wake up! Time to die! Now this is said during Blade Runner when Leon is fighting Deckard. Before he thinks he's gonna kill him, he says, wake up, time to die. And while we're on the topic of Forks real quick, if asked about his name, he will reply with, It was taken from a historical entry in the computer. Mm, the name comes from a man who was willing to fight and die for what he believed in. I felt it was appropriate, given my circumstances. This is of course referencing Guy Fawkes, the explosives guardian for the gunpowder treason plot of 1605, in which they planned on blowing up the English House of Lords during the state opening of Parliament. And building off of this, in Alan Moore's 1988 graphic novel, V for Vendetta, the main protagonist, V, wore a Guy Fawkes mask. And essentially, V personifies Guy Fawkes. Now, when V was locked up, he was kept in cell number five. And Fawkes, here in Fallout 3, is also kept in cell number five within Vault 87. Two guys related to Guy Fawkes, two guys staying in the same cell number. Interesting. Now, provided your character has the contract killer perk at the scrapyard, we can find a contract killing company called Little Horn and Associates, doing evil deeds that others dare not. Now, the owner of this company is Daniel Littlehorn, which is not a last name anyone wants. But this guy must be a devil of a man to run such a business. Well, funnily enough, that might be closer to the truth than we think, as Daniel Littlehorn gets his name from the Book of Daniel, Chapter 8, where Daniel is given a prophecy where Little Horn represents various vessels or personifications of the Antichrist, the devil. So as Daniel Littlehorn here in Fallout 3 is performing devilish acts, he lives up to the prophecy of Littlehorn from the book of Daniel. Ah yes, now the in-game cleaning agent known as Abraxo is a reference to the real-life cleaning agent called Boraxo. I'm sure you've seen these guys around, the Brahmin. Once cows, now mutated and given this new name, Brahmin. But where did it come from? Well, there is a breed of cattle called Brahmin, or Brahma, which is likely where the name comes from. However, this name may also refer to the Brahmin of Hindu culture, where Brahmin is a Vana or caste that specializes in producing priests and teachers of sacred law. One of the traditions, of course, being the reverence of cattle. Because of this, the name Brahman for the animal was seen as offensive to Hindu culture, and the use of the name Brahman in Fallout 3 was actually banned in India. Bit of an overreaction, personally I think they should have just uh, moved on. Which is what we're going to do right now. So inside the Museum of Technology, in the Planetarium exhibit, there is a pre-recorded tour. For as long as history has been recorded, man has had an insatiable hunger for knowledge regarding the universe that is heavily based on and sounds like Carl Sagan and his introduction to the Cosmos series, with both content delivery and voice. 
Okay, so inside the NN-03D-B at the SATCOM array NN-03D, there is a chessboard with pieces made up of miniaturized versions of common objects throughout the game. As we can see, some of them are kind of out of place. And strangely, if we pick up one of the pieces, all the other pieces will attempt to move back into their proper place. Of course, things shift around a bit, a few pieces fall over. But this is a completely unique Fallout 3 chess set. It's the only one like it, and I don't know who went to the effort of building it. And while I would love to sit down for a match, I don't want to play against anyone who brings a gun to a chess fight. Now you've probably seen many of these around, but the car manufacturing brand in Fallout called Chrysler is a clear reference to the real life car company Chrysler. Now there are several characters who are allusions to real life people who lived during the American Civil War. Hannibal Hamlin is the leader of the Temple of the Union, which is a location housing escaped slaves. He also wishes to one day build a haven for escaped slaves at Lincoln's Memorial. Well, Hannibal Hamlin was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president who was a staunch abolitionist. Similarly, Bill Seward, who is an escaped slave and abolitionist, is named after William H. Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State from 1861 to 1869. Again, like the others, Caleb Smith, an escaped slave and abolitionist, is named after Caleb B. Smith, Lincoln's Secretary of the Interior from 1861 to 1862. The character Simone Cameron, an escaped slave and abolitionist, is named after Simon Cameron. Lincoln's Secretary of War from 1861 to 1862. And there's a guy called Leroy Walker, who is a slaver at Paradise Falls and is named after Leroy Pope Walker, the first Confederate States Secretary of War who issued the orders for the firing on Fort Sumter, which began the American Civil War. And at Lincoln's Memorial or the Temple of the Union, depending on which quests have been completed, there is a dog who accompanies the slaves and the abolitionists, and this dog's name is Four Score. This name is a reference to President Abraham Lincoln's Getzeburg Address of 1863, where the opening two words of his speech were Four Score, and they repeated throughout the speech as well. And that's where this pup gets his name. Now this one had me stumped and to be honest still does, but it's too cool to not put in. So inside the cliffside cave, as soon as you enter, there is a skull inside a guy's chest cavity with an arm coming out of its mouth, holding up another skull, which has lights coming out of its eyes, which is a completely unique feature. Originally, I thought this might have been a reference to the chest bursters from the alien universe, but there seems to be a big emphasis on hands, and also the aliens don't have eyes, and this thing does. So even though I don't know if it is a reference to anything, it's way too weird, unique, and cool to not put in this list. Okay, so in Megaton, we will meet a Mr. Handy called Wadsworth, who can become our personal butler. This bundle of bolts is a reference to Tim Curry's character, Mr. Wadsworth, who was the butler in the 1985 film Clue. Wadsworth in Fallout 3 here also speaks in a similar accent to Wadsworth from Clue, along with, of course, both of them being butlers. Now, Wadsworth can also be heard joking, War does not determine who is right. Only who is left. This is a quote from Bertrand Russell, and also heard jesting about he can say this. Yeah, the two cannibals are eating a clown. One cannibal turns to the other and asks, does this taste funny to you? Which is a joke borrowed from Tommy Cooper, a famed comedian of the 20th century. So it's almost needless to say that, in fact, Nuka-Cola is entirely based off of the real-life Coca-Cola. The bottle shape, the vending machines, the advertisement, the font of the logo, all of it seems to mirror those of Coca-Cola. There is also a character named Sierra Petrovita who we actually run into in Fallout 4's DLC Nuka World. However, in Fallout 3, she is totally addicted to new cola although she denies it. And inside the Statesman Hotel, we can also find a guy that appears to have drunk himself to death with new cola Needless to say, new cola is addictive, and this is likely a nod to the fact that the original recipe for Coca-Cola contained cocaine, which made it pretty addictive. And the iconic Nuka-Cola Quantum is actually a reference to Coca-Cola C2, which was advertised as having 
half the carbohydrates, sugars and calories of regular Coca-Cola. In the complete opposite fashion, Coca-Cola Quantum is advertised as twice the calories, twice the carbohydrates, and twice the caffeine and twice the taste of regular Nuka-Cola. Making fun, of course, the goofball culture of pre-war fallout. And there's more Nuka-Cola stuff, but we'll get to that later on when we hit Pepsi. So there's a place called Fort Constantine, which is a large intercontinental ballistic missile launching facility. We learned that the launch codes for the missiles in-game are the incredible difficult and complicated code of 00000000000. A bunch of zeros is the code to the nuclear warheads. That's pretty funny, right? And seemingly ridiculous. But this is actually a reference to the United States nuclear launch codes which were created in 1961 during the Cold War, which were this same thing, just a string of zeros. And the reason they did that was so the response time would be faster, not having to punch in a complicated launch code, they just had to spam the zero button to launch the nukes. And these codes were not changed until 1977. And then, thankfully, they were changed to a more complicated code, you know, something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, something like that. So in the slaver's camp known as Paradise Falls that we spoke of earlier, there is actually a captive here called Rory McLarens, who, if you're lucky, can be heard saying this. Can't nobody eat 50 eggs. This line is a reference to the 1967 prison drama film called Cool Hand Luke, in which the title character Luke, while imprisoned, claims that he can eat 50 eggs. Naturally, many of the other inmates disagree that he can do it, dropping lines similar, if not identical, to what we hear here in Fallout 3. Can't nobody eat 50 eggs. Going back to simple for a second, the famous food within the Fallout universe, Cram, is a reference to the real life Spam. And the fearsome Myalok kings that we can encounter, usually near water, have had their physical appearance modeled off of the creature from the Black Lagoon from the 1954 horror film of the same name, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. As we can see here, the resemblance is uncanny. Now inside the Roosevelt Academy, which is a esteemed school, there is a protectron that can be found wandering the halls called Dean Dewey. His role is the head disciplinarian programmed to fill the role of the principal at the Roosevelt Academy, ensuring students are behaving. His name is derived from both John Dewey, who was an educational reformer, and Melvin Dewey, who created the Dewey Decimal System. Both Deweys greatly influencing modern day America education in one way or another, coming together to form Dean Dewey, right here in Fallout 3. Okay, so going back to the Statesman's Hotel, on one of the mid floors, there is a hotel room with a closed bathroom door. If we open it, we'll be greeted by a skeleton slumped over the side of a bathtub with paper lying on the ground next to him. This scene that we find is a reference to the 1793 painting, The Death of Marat, depicting the murdered French revolutionary leader, Jean Paul Marat, as he slumped over the side of his bath, murdered, with paper by his side. During the quest, those Brian Wilkes, who is inside the Pulowski Preservation Shelter, can be heard saying, Now I know what a TV dinner feels like. This line is taken directly from the 1988 action thriller, Die Hard, during which the character John McClane, played by Bruce Willis, is in the precarious situation of crawling through the ventilation shafts of a building. And while he's doing so, he says, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. Similarly to how Brian Wilkes is in a not so hot predicament. And also this character, Brian Wilkes, is a reference to the actor Bruce Willis who plays the main protagonist in Die Hard and who drops the same line. During the quest, the Nuka-Cola challenge, if Sierra dies by the time the quest is finished and Ronald is spoken to, there is actually a speech check we can pass where we blame Nuka-Cola Corporation for her death. Ronald will say, Crap! This has to be about the Nuka-Cola machine I got for her. It had this label on it saying, Warning, if you tamper with this unit, you will have to answer to the Nuka-Cola Corporation. Now I bet they're after me. Oh god, I gotta hide, I gotta go! Now this line is actually a reference to the classic 1964 political satire film Dr. Strangeglove, where 
Major Mandrake forces Colonel Guano to shoot the lock off of a Coke vending machine so that he can get enough change to call the president with the payphone. But before doing so, Colonel Guano warns Major Mandrake, if you don't get the president, you're gonna to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. It had this label on it saying, warning, if you tamper with this unit, you will have to answer to the Nuka-Cola Corporation. The explosive skill book called Duck and Cover takes its name from the 1950s and 1960s short Cold War propaganda educational videos in which Bert the Turtle would duck and cover at any sign of danger. An easter egg we also saw in the Wolfenstein Old Blood easter egg video. And along with this we can also find some pre-war propaganda posters that have been modelled off of the original Duck and Cover film. Depicting a turtle hiding from bombs essentially which is eh, the whole plot of Bert the Turtle and his propaganda films. Okay, so during the quest, The Power of Atom, if we choose to side with Mr. Burke and Mr. Tenpenny that we spoke of earlier, and blow up Megaton with the nuclear bomb, most of the people will die, but Moira Brown will actually survive. She's a bit roughed up, as she's now become a ghoul. And when we first encounter her after this uh, rad cool transformation, one of the dialogue options will be Moira, don't take this the wrong way, but you got ugly real fast. This line is a reference to the 1992 film Evil Dead 3 Army of Darkness, where the protagonist Ash says to Sheila, Honey, you got real ugly, after she takes a pretty ugly transformation into a witch. I'm sure you've seen them, I'm sure you've heard them, the iBots that fly around the wasteland. Well check this out, the iBots have actually had their physical appearance modelled off of the Sputnik 1 Russian satellite, which is very distinct in appearance and when put side by side they look like siblings. Oh here's a good one, one for the keen eyed. Inside the cafeteria of Vault 101 where we start the game, during our birthday party, if you look next to the jukebox, there is a kind of notice board thing, a billboard with a bunch of different papers on it. But if we see here, there is a poster for Bingo Night, where we can see the number 13 represented, and the winning prize is a week's supply of water rations. 13. Water. Vaults. Hmm. Well, this is actually a reference to the main quest of the original Fallout game, where we were a member of Vault 13 and we had to go out into the wasteland and get a water chip to save Vault 13's water supply. This poster for Bingo, the number 13 in the water rations for a week, being a very subtle but clever reference to that. And at the end of the quest Trouble on the Home Front, based in Vault 101, if the quest is completed by killing the Overseer, a martyr will give us dialogue that bears striking similarities to the same speech given to the Vault Dweller at the end of the original Fallout game. Here are the two pieces of dialogue. <sighs> I've made a lot of tough decisions since I took this position, but none of them harder than this one. You saved us. But you'll kill us. I'm sorry. You're a hero. And you have to leave. I realize that, and I don't blame you. If you hadn't been here, maybe one of us would have done the same. You saved us. But that doesn't change the fact that you killed the Overseer in cold blood to do it. And I can't let that sort of thing stand here. I'm sorry. You're a hero, and you have to leave both striking great similarities in both dialogue and plot. As we spoke of earlier with the Bethesda lunch bell, the weapon the Fat Man, again I'm sure we've all used it a million times, it is a uh, miniaturized personalized nuclear missile launcher, an iconic weapon in the Fallout franchise, but did you know that it takes its name from the atomic bomb that was detonated over Nagasaki in Japan 1945? Because of this, in Japanese releases of Fallout 3, the name of the Fat Man had been changed, or has been changed, to the Nuka Launcher. Similarly, during the quest of the Power of Atom, the character, Mr. Burke, who lets you rig the bomb in Megaton and blow up the whole town using the nuke. Well, this character, Mr. Burke, the pathway to blowing up a nuke isn't present in the Japanese version of the game. 
This of course prevents players from rigging the bomb in Megaton, therefore not allowing players to blow it up. This is of course due to the nuclear memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now in the Museum of Technology, we can find the Research Leads Terminal. The first entry contains a Fear Factory Easter egg. The two lines, the infection has been removed. The soul of this machine has improved. These lines come from the song Archetype, which is also in the name of the main frame on this terminal here, Archetype Model FF06. Now Archetype being the song and the album, FF standing for Fear Factory and 06 refers to the album Archetype being Fear Factory's sixth studio album release. And finally, the researcher's name that made this entry is B Bell. Of course, Fear Factory's vocalist is one Burton C. Bell. This is one probably no one's noticed, but it is cool. So throughout the wasteland, throughout the game of Fallout 3, we'll come across many plates, cups, trays, just blah blah blah, random knickknacks, all that good stuff. But did you ever notice that most of the plates are the standard looking plates? But every now and then you'll come across a red plate. Well, this rarer red plate is a reference to a rare red plate in real life produced by Fiestaware. They weren't the only company that did this, but Fiestaware we're concentrating on that. So Fiestaware made these red plates with this glorious bright orange slash red color by adding uranium oxide into the glaze. And yes, this made the plates radioactive, but it also made them red. They were produced three times between 1936 and 1943 using natural uranium, between 59 and 69 using depleted uranium, and between 69 and 73 using once again depleted uranium. Now the discontinuation of these plates, the rarer color, and the idea of having a radioactive plate has actually made these red uranium Fiestaware plates quite collectible. And just like in Fallout 3, they are rarer than the standard plate. And coming just in time to heal all that radiation from those uranium plates, inside the Grizzly Diner, there is a first aid box mounted on the wall, which for no apparent reason is twice the size as every other first aid box in the game. Heading outside for a stroll, there is a location called F. Scott Key Trail and Campground which is named after Francis Scott Key, who famously wrote the lyrics to the American national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner. And while there are real-world locations named after him, this one here in Fallout 3 does not exist in the real world and is entirely fictional, built specifically in reference to Francis Scott here in Fallout 3. And similarly, the location called Fordham Flash Memorial Field is named after Francis Frankie Frisch, a prominent baseball player in the 20th century. And once again, this field does not exist in real life and has been created purely as a reference to Francis Frankie Frisch here in Fallout 3. Now, if you've ever looked at a Protectron and thought, hmm, that looks kind of familiar, well, there's a good reason why. The Protectrons are actually based off of Robbie the Robot from the 1956 science fiction movie Forbidden Planet. When we have them side by side, the influence is obvious. And also influenced from this movie, we have the Alien Blaster and all the unique variants of it. Their design is heavily based off of Commander Adam's pistol from the movie Forbidden Planet, sharing that bulbous retro futuristic ray gun motif. The projectiles also disperse in a similar fashion when they hit a solid surface. Ah yes, at the SATCOM array NN-03D, outside there is a door that any and all curious cats have opened. Upon doing so, therein is the lovely and rather troll message of F*** you. It seems curiosity didn't kill the cat, it just cursed at it. Now, Deputy Steel of Megaton will say this if attacked. What is your major malfunction, maggot? This line is a reference to a similar line from Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film Full Metal Jacket, where Sergeant Hartman yells, What is your major malfunction, numbnuts? at Private Pile. Now, this one's kind of weird. So, outside, the vault door for Vault 101, we can find two skeletons. They appear to have been holding picket signs saying, help us, we're dying, 
let us in, that kind of stuff, suggesting that they were trying to get into the vault at some point, but ended up passing away probably because nukes dropped. That tends to kill people. Now as interesting as that is, inside the Chrysler's building, in the bathroom, there are two garter gnomes standing on the toilets, each holding an identical picket sign to the ones we saw outside Vault 101. Weird. Were the gnomes alive and mimicking humans? It wouldn't be the first time we've seen this phenomenon. Ah yes, George Orwell's 1984. How could we have a dystopian future without some references to that? So Irving Cheng is a self-proclaimed descendant of Chairman Cheng, who in the Fallout universe was the leader of China during the Great War of 2077. And on his computer he has daily affirmations, one of which reads, Cheng is watching you, referencing of course, the famous and eerie Big Brother is watching you from 1984. Similarly, inside Vault 92 on the Overseas Terminal, we can find the phrase sanity is not statistical, which was used as a secret passcode within Vault 92 to stop the, and I quote, crazies. Basically over time, Vault 92's residents started going crazy and this command, sanity is not statistical, would stop them in their tracks. Fittingly, in 1984, the book, not the year, Winston repeats this line to himself, sanity is not statistical, as he falls asleep to reassure himself that just because he's unlike everyone else in thinking does not mean he's insane. Just because he's against the statistics doesn't mean he's not sane. Sanity is not statistical. Now, I suppose many similarities to the governmental system of 1984 and the hierarchy within vaults they're pretty similar. If the Overseer's rule is disobeyed, punishment will ensue. A scary power system rather like that in 1984, just on a much smaller scale. Well, what's quite interesting is, within 1984, persons accused of thought crime are taken to a place called Room 101, where they are tortured until they comply. Rather like what could happen to you inside Vault 101. Now deep within the Robco Repair Center is the Mechanist's Lair. As we enter, a series of heavy duty blast doors will open in all different directions and it's actually quite fun to watch. But these ridiculously over the top doors are a reference to the closing doors seen at the end of each episode of the 1960s comedy series Get Smart where we would watch the main character, Agent Maxwell, walk through a series of varying heavy duty blast doors, just like we see here in the Mechanist's Lair. So inside the Red Racer factory, there is a hanging tricycle being mounted by a giant teddy bear. This is by far the second largest teddy bear in Fallout 3. And the largest teddy bear in Fallout 3 can be found at the SATCOM array NN-03D inside the NN-03D-B. On the lower floor, there is a chemistry station, behind which is a boarded over doorway. What's behind this doorway? Well, if we use either a lot of explosives or console commands, we can get a better look at what is on the other side. Hidden away in this unreachable spot is in fact, the largest teddy bear in all of Fallout 3. What it's doing here, why it's here, I don't know, but as we can see, here's my character and the teddy bear, and it's a lot bigger than a normal teddy bear. In fact, it's so big, it's just almost too much to bear. At the ghoul city known as Underworld, there is a Mr. Gutsy that guards it. His name is Cerberus. This name is a reference to the three-headed dog from Greek mythology, which guards the gates to hell or the Underworld, just as Cerebus does here in Fallout 3. Also found in Underworld is a ghoul named Sharon, who is the bouncer of the bar called the Ninth Circle. Now his name and role are references to Sharon, the ferryman from Greek mythology, who would allow people to cross the river Styx into the Underworld, much like what Sharon does here in Fallout 3. Now on the second floor of Underworld, there is a massive painting, although slightly ruined, we can still make out what it is. This is a piece called Dante and Virgil in Hell by French artist William Adolphe Bouguereau, which is based on a scene from 
Inferno of the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. And following suit, the bar called the Ninth Circle is also a reference to Dante's Inferno as to wherein, Inferno, Dante and Virgil travel through the nine circles of hell, the ninth being the last where Lucifer resides. And of course, the place that it's in is Underworld in Fallout 3. But also down here, inside Carol's place, there is another painting of Dante and Virgil meeting, done by Dutch-French romantic artist Ari Scheffer. Now onto a lighter note. On the Galaxy News Radio, there is a segment where we follow the adventures of Herbert Daring Dashwood. You're listening to the adventures of me, Herbert Daring Dashwood, and my stalwart ghoul manservant, Argyle. This is a reference to the 1930s radio program, The Green Hornet, where Britt Reed would fight crime, which was delivered in the exact same fashion with the same theme as Herbert Daring Dashwood is here in Fallout 3. Ah yes, everyone's favourite comic book hero, Grognak the Barbarian, first introduced in Fallout 3 and he's got a lot going on. So the hubris comic book character in the Fallout universe called Grognak the Barbarian is based off of the fictional character Conan the Barbarian, who would have guessed, both physically and in name. And while Conan the Barbarian was popularised by Arnold Schwarzenegger's portrayal of the character in the 1982 film Conan the Barbarian, the character was originally written and published by Robert E. Howard in 1932 in Pulp Fiction magazine, making the original much closer to what we see here in Fallout with Grognak being a comic book character. Now speaking of the comics, the one we find in Fallout 3, Grognak the Barbarian, in the lair of the Virgin Eater, has borrowed its artwork and name from the real life Conan the Barbarian comic Lair of the Ice Worm. As we can see, the designs of both comic books covers are very, very similar. Also, on this particular comic book cover, the pose in which Grognak is performing greatly resembles the Barbarian class image from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, which is entirely fitting as, of course, both are Bethesda's Game Studios games and both are dealing with Barbarians. Also, Grognak's axe is almost identical to the Steel Battle Axe from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. As we can see here, the similarities are extraordinary. So if you do ever play a Barbarian in Oblivion, just know you're playing the foreshadowing of Grognak. Now, when hacking terminals, every single word that can be selected is a real word. There's a massive database of words that can be randomly generated to be used when hacking terminals. But there's one word in there that isn't a real word, and that is GURPS. Now this word, GURPS, is a reference to the name of an RPG rules system that Fallout was originally planned to be based upon. However, GURPS, or the generic universal role-playing system, was later replaced by the special system, which of course stands for Strength, Perception, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck. The special system, of course, that we know and love from Fallout now. But if you ever see GURPS and wonder what the hell that is, that's what GURPS is a role-playing system that wasn't implemented into Fallout. Ah yes, now the guys at Bethesda love an HP Lovecraft reference in their games, as we know with such things like the tall tale of the Deep Ones from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. But here in Fallout 3, they planted a fat one. The Dunwich building and its whole surrounding story are all in reference to HP Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, especially the 1929 short story, The Dunwich Horror. Clearly, the name of the building, the Dunwich Building, but more so, the whispering obelisk bound in the virulent underchambers. This obelisk also whispers repeatedly the name Alhazred and occasionally says Geth. Also, on Jamie's final audio log, he also says both of these words. Just listen. Sharp knife. Sharp knife to send him to Deep Temple. Flay and say my words. Abdul comes again on the feast of the weaker. Feast uh, for the Deep Temple. Born again. Here. Alhazared. Yes. 
Yet. Now in the HP Lovecraft universe, the author of the Necronomicon is Abdul Alhazred. The last name, Alhazred, is what's being said by both the Obelisk and Jamie in his audio recording in Fallout 3. Now the other word, Gif, is likely a reference to Rulia, the underwater city in which Cthulhu, an old one, awaits. For the Elder Scrolls 6. Also, seemingly randomly, at the Red Racer factory inside the CEO offices, one can hear these same voices, Alhazred and Gieth. Perhaps the Red Racer CEO dabbled in the dark art to increase share value, or something like that. Now the picture of the Animal Friends perk is, as we can see, Vault Boy with his arm around a giant human-sized rabbit. This is actually a reference to the play Harvey, in which the main character claims to have an invisible friend that is a six foot three and a half inch tall anthropomorphic rabbit, just as we see here in the Animal Friend perk. Now you might have noticed that the hockey masks throughout Fallout 3 look kind of weird and not quite like any hockey mask you've seen before. Well, that's because they have been based off of the crude homemade masks made and worn by Jacques Plant. After his nose was broken three minutes into a game, he refused to play without the mask on. This led him to later making masks for other gold tenders and eventually made the hockey mask a mandatory piece of equipment even in Fallout 3. But this particular one here in-game is based off the original homemade crude practice mask that he made for himself to protect his schnoz from rocketing pucks. At Little Lamplight, there is a dog named Hooligan. This dog got its name from a real-life dog called Hooligan, owned by one of Fallout 3's level designers, Fred Zeleny. So that's how you do it. All I need to do is be owned by one of BGS's staff as a pet, and I too can finally make it into one of their games as an easter egg. Now occasionally, when engaged in combat, a Mr. Gutsy will say, I'm starting to get angry. You would not like me when I'm angry. This line is a nod to Dr. Banner when he says to Mr. McGee during the opening sequence of the TV series, The Incredible Hulk, Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. And juicing off of the Hulk mania, the image used for the Nerd Rage perk is a nod to Dr. Bruce Banner transforming into the Hulk. Ah yes, back to Interplay, the guys that originally made the Fallout games. So, in Chevy Chase, there is a square with a rather unique structure haloing the center, a bronze earth with a rocket ship circling orbiting it. This is actually a nod to the now defunct Interplay Entertainment, the original creators of the Fallout franchise. The bronze earth with a circling rocket appeared prominently when launching Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 and it was actually originally the logo of GNN, Galaxy News Network, before it was adopted by Interplay as their official logo in real life. So, in a subtle fashion, Bethesda Game Studios has given the original founders of the Fallout franchise a little nod with their own weird structure outside a train station. Now the perk of the Iron Fist is named after the Marvel comic the Iron Fist, who could concentrate his chi energy into devastating blows, much like the perk allows you. Oh, kind of sad. At the location known as Tacoma Park, we can find the remains of Isabella Proud and Jason Proud. Here there is also a terminal, which has many diary entries detailing the pair's field research on feral ghouls. The diary entries detail Isabella's observations, interactions, and affection for the feral ghouls in very much the same way that Diane Fossey's story played out with the Rwandan mountain gorillas, which is exactly what this entire scene and little story has been based off of. A female scientist trying to connect and get closer with creatures that are generally thought of as dangerous, keeping track of the diary records and naming some of them and things like that. And quite sadly, just like Diane Fossey, Isabel Proud and Jason Proud's interest and love for the feral ghouls led them to their demise. 
Now near the capital, we can find the Anchorage Memorial, at the center of which is a massive statue of US soldiers. Well, in real life, this is actually the location of the statue commemorating the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima, Japan on February 23, 1945. Fallout has just altered it a bit to fit their universe a little better, with these guys striking this like crazy heroic poses. And there is actually more to this Easter egg, but we'll have to wait for the Operation Anchorage Easter egg video. Don't want to spoil anything. Oh yes, now inside the Deathclaw Sanctuary, we can find the corpse of an Enclave officer. On her corpse, there is a unique Ripper called Jack, or Jack the Ripper. It actually changes depending on what version of the game you have. But, point being, weapon type is a Ripper, and the name of it is Jack or Jack the Ripper. So either way, we have a weapon that is Jack the Ripper. Of course, this name is a reference to the notorious serial killer who hunted and mutilated women beyond recognition throughout London during the late 19th century. Living up to its name, this weapon Jack the Ripper will do just that. Although it does function outside of London, unlike the original. I could not believe this one when I found out about it. So during the opening minutes, of Fallout 3, when the player character is playing a baby, we will have the appropriate baby voice. Now you might be interested to know that this part was actually voice acted by none other than Todd Howard's son, Jake Howard, when he turned one year old. And you know what? If you listen really carefully, I reckon you can hear Todd in his son's baby voice. Seriously, listen really closely. It just works. All jests aside, this is legit. Jake Howard, Todd Howard's one-year-old son, actually voice acted the baby at the start of the game. And you know what's interesting? By the time he turns 21, he will have worked in the gaming industry for 20 years. So the juke boxes that can be found throughout Fallout 3 might look familiar. That's because they've been almost identically modeled after the Wellitzer 1015, one of, if not the most popular antique jukebox and jukebox style. It's the jukebox you think of when you hear the word jukebox. Ah yes, there is a series of holotapes that tell of the demise of the Keller family that tried to survive after the bombs dropped in a bunker. This is fitting as their family name Keller means basement in German, the very thing they attempted to survive in. Now the brand of cameras in the Fallout universe are Kodak cameras, Kodak with a C. This is of course a reference to the real world brand of cameras of the same name, just spelled with a K, Kodak. Oh yeah, so at the Museum of History, we can get a gun called Lincoln's Repeater. This weapon is based off of the real life Henry rifle given to Abraham Lincoln by the New Haven Arms Company in a hope to inspire others to purchase their weapons. Now Lincoln's repeater in game bears the exact same engraved golden mounting and is signed with his name. It's also a great gun to use in game. It's not that good, but it's fun to use. I like it. Along the same lines during the quest, Lincoln's profit margins, we'll come across a phonautograph which was the earliest known device that was able to record sounds. Now this one in game is called Lincoln's Voice. This is a reference to a modern legend where allegedly the inventor of the phonautograph recorded Lincoln's voice. However, because this story did not surface until the 1960s, some hundred years after the events allegedly took place, its authenticity is not really there. Oh. And there is also no physical evidence of this recording existing. However, in the Fallout universe, it seems they found it, and that is what this Lincoln's voice in-game is a reference to. Now the company in Fallout 3 that uh, contracts for the United States Armed Forces is called Lockreed Industries. This company is a reference to the real-life aerospace engineering company Lockheed Martin. So. In Megaton, there is a character named Billy Creel. Here in his house, we can find a safe that he owns. Now, if we talk to his adopted daughter, she will actually give us the code to the safe. Well, Billy built a safe into the floor of our house. He keeps all sorts of cool stuff in there. I shouldn't tell you this, but the combination is 15, 16, 
2342 if you want to take a look. Just make sure that you put everything back if you take anything out to play with it. I don't want to get in trouble. Now if you've ever seen this show Lost, these numbers might sound familiar as 15, 16, 23, 42 are the latter two thirds of a reoccurring string of numbers from the show. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. Each corresponds with one of the final candidates to replace Jacob as protector of the island. The numbers also formed the coefficients in an equation that predicted mankind's extinction. But that is neither here nor there. It's just lost. In Little Lamplight, there is a character named Lucy. In Lucy's clinic, in the office building, there is a banner which reads, The Doctor is In. Now this is a reference to Lucy from the Peanuts comic strip, where she pretended to be a psychiatric doctor and had a matching banner reading, The Doctor is In, just like Lucy here in Full Out 3 does. Alright, so while there are many things and worlds that have influenced the Full Out universe, as we're about to discover, the Mad Max universe sure played a part in Fallout 3's concepts, which makes sense as Mad Max is a big, goofy, crazy, post-apocalyptic universe, ding ding, ring any bells, yeah, Fallout has a very similar theme. Anyway, let's take a closer look at the specifics. Firstly, this image of the Lone Wanderer and his dog was used in various releases and products for Fallout 3. At this point, it's almost an iconic shot. But this is actually based off of this shot of Mad Max and his dog, which he brilliantly named Dog, which is taken from the 1981 film Mad Max 2, Road Warrior. And while we're on the topic of his dog, Dog, Fallout 3's dog meets breed is a blue healer. Exactly the same breed as Mad Max's dog in Mad Max 2, the Road Warrior. Wonder where they got that idea from. There's also a random encounter in which we can run into a guy called Mel, who rocks a leather jacket and wields a sawn-off shotgun. If you have a high enough perception, you can actually see that his shotgun is in fact not loaded. This has been taken from Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, where at certain points in the movie Max has no ammunition in his shotgun, yet acts as if he does to threaten others. And of course, the character Mel is referencing Mel Gibson who played Mad Max. Now the leather armor one can frequently come across throughout Fallout 3 appears to have been almost entirely based off of Mad Max's leather armor he wears throughout the Mad Max series. But in particular, it is very similar to the single-sleeved armor worn by Max in Mad Max 2 Road Warrior, as we can see them here side by side. Building off of this, in a broader stroke, all of the raiders and their chosen attire appear to have taken heavy influence from the various antagonist gangs and groups throughout the various Mad Max movies with their gimpish, bold, mismatched costumes. Also, the motorcycle helmets in Fallout 3 have also been based off of the motorcycle helmets that are worn by the same marauders in Road Warrior. And while sure, it's a motorcycle helmet, it's a weird one, and a very specific one, which also very specifically appears in Mad Max. On a similar note, the medical brace in Fallout 3 appears to have been based off of the leg brace that Mad Max wears on his left leg throughout the series. And before you ask, medical slash leg braces come in a million different shapes and sizes and styles, yet the one in Fallout 3 almost perfectly matches the one from Mad Max. Coincidence? Nope. On a similar path, while a rather common design, the style of the 44 scoped Magnum is almost identical to the Magnum used by Lord Humongous in Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, minus the Fallout 3 version's barrel being shorter. And again, it's a pretty generic looking weapon, but the material types, the material colors, all that stuff, it matches up perfectly. Coincidence? Maybe. Now occasionally during combat, when a super mutant gets frustrated, they will yell, No more games! I could die! This line has been taken from Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior when Among Us loses his patience and yells, Quiet! Quiet! No more games. Among Us being a huge, muscly, veiny hulk 
with a mutated head similar in stature to Super Mutants. Now the character Mamacredi of Little Lamplight is a character I'm sure we all know and love, and we even run into him in Fallout 4. But did you know that Mary McCready's outfit is based on the outfit worn by Jedediah Jr. in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome? As they both wear plinth helmets, goggles and a jacket that are too big for them. Also, Little Lamplight, a colony of children, is likely based thematically off of the children's colony that Mad Max encounters during Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, a society of children living by themselves. And finally, when we meet Harkins and tell him we're just looking for our dad, he will reply with, Oh yeah? And I'm a fairy princess. Now this line is taken from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome when Max utters it under his voice sarcastically to Master Blaster. There is an ice cream store known as Majority Whips. Now this is actually a play on a political phrase and position of a whip where you can have minority whips or majority whips. I won't even attempt to explain what a whip is because I don't understand it despite reading it. But nevertheless, this ice cream store Majority Whip has taken its name from that political phenomenon. So in Rivet City, Dr. Zimmer, the creator of the androids, or a sense as they will later be known, is likely a reference to the film Man Droid, in which one, Dr. Carl Zimmer, is the creator of a humanoid robot, exactly the same as we have here in Fallout 3. So throughout the game of Fallout 3, we can come across many different consumables, one of which is a chem known as Mentats. These Mentats actually get their name from a faction or type of being called nothing other than Mentats from the 1965 Frank Herbert novel Dune. These Mentats in Dune are essentially people trained to have the cognitive abilities of a computer. In short, their intelligence is enhanced. Well, in a similar fashion, in Fallout 3, when Mentats are consumed, the character's intelligence and perception are boosted, taking the consumer to a closer level of the Mentats from June. Throughout Fallout 3, the brand of cigarettes that we can come across are called Big Boss. This brand name is in reference to Metal Gear Solid and the character Big Boss, also known as Jack and Snake and about a billion other names. But one of Big Boss's reoccurring tropes is smoking. He can often be seen puffing on a cigar or smuggling cigarettes and cigars into missions so he can smoke. Well, it looks like someone at Bethesda likes Metal Gear and they even named the brand of cigarettes after Big Boss. On occasion, the super mutant forks that we spoke of earlier will say, I only kill to know I'm alive! Now this is a lyric taken from the Ministry song, So What, off of their 1989 release, The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste. At the location of Fort Independence, there is a Brotherhood outcast called Defender Morgan. If we ask her what she had against the Brotherhood, she will reply as such. You mean apart from the fact that they ditched their mission and went native? Sure. I bet you don't mind them being cuddly with the locals. But when we came out here, we had a mission to do, damn it. But now they're wasting their time protecting yahoos like you, while Ahab Lyons is off chasing his super mutant white whale. Notice she calls Elder Lyons Ahab Lyons, and also notes that he is chasing his super mutant white whale. What she is doing is referencing the 1851 Herman Melville novel Moby Dick, in which Captain Ahab vengefully hunts the white whale known as Moby Dick. So inside the Museum of Technology, several terminal entries house notes written by the lead researcher, Professor R.J. Gumby. This guy is a reference to a character of the same name, Professor R.J. Gumby, who was one of the Gumbies from Monty Python and the Flying Circus. Along the same serpentine lines, when talking to Squire Maxon, he says, No, but I could. I know I'm ready. I mean, it would be scary, but it's not fair that I have to sit inside while the knights go on patrol. I did go out one time, you know. Sarah, a, a Sentinel Lions, took me out, just to show me. I killed a super mutant too, I swear. I, uh, I also sort of shot Sarah, but just a little. It was just a flesh wound. This line is of course a reference to the Black Knight. 
in the 1975 Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where during a duel between King Arthur and the Black Knight, the Black Knight has both his arms cut off, but shrugs it away with the line, it's just a flesh wound. Now Kimber found a big town can be heard dropping this line. That's funny, I thought we were an autonomous collective. Which has been taken from the Holy Grail, which is said by a woman in some random village, when she is surprised to learn that there is a current ruling king. Because she thought that we were an autonomous collective. And inside the Megaton Clinic on Doc Church's desk, there is a broken terminal that displays the hex code 0x41a1a013. When translated into text, it says, Meh. This is of course a reference to the Holy Grail, and more specifically, the knights who say, when you complete the Head of State quest in favor of the slavers, we'll be able to hear Three Dogs saying this. One small step backwards for man. One giant evolutionary rewind for mankind. Which is of course a reference to Neil Armstrong's famous quote after taking his first steps on the surface of the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Which by the way, he actually got wrong. He was meant to say one step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, but he got it wrong. But I reckon the one that he actually said is better. Ah, okay, so inside the Hubris Comics building, on one of the terminals, we can find a message that reads as follows. How can a hack like that continue to find work in comics is beyond my comprehension. Hubris Comics should fire him and return the series to the capable hands of Mr. Morales. Well, the name of this incredibly capable comic book writer, Mr. Morales, is actually a combination of Alan Moore and Warren Ellis, taking their last names, Moore and Ellis, combining them into Mr. Morales. Now, Alan Moore and Warren Ellis are both very famous real-life comic book writers, hence the relevance in Full Art 3's Hubris Comics. Also, in the same terminal entry, there is mention of a Mr. Neptune. This name is referencing a character named Mato Neptune from Alan Moore's ongoing series, Promethea. On another terminal, in the beta testing area, there is a text-based adventure game called Reign of Grelock which again, is a completely text-based game. This is in reference to the original text-based adventure games of the 70s and 80s, such as Colossal Cave, Adventure, and Zork. Now going back to Dr. Zimmer, the man we have visited many times now, will say this when he learns that his android is, in fact, in Rivet City. Harkness, you say? Yes, yes, that makes sense. He used to work for a special branch of the Commonwealth Police, after all. And he's right here, in Rivet City? This line is a reference to the song Trouble, right here in River City, from a musical named The Music Man. River City being replaced by Rivet City. Now behind Little Lamplight, there is a section called Murder Pass, which has received such a name as it is now overrun by Super Mutants. Scattered around the ground, if one looks closely, will notice that all of the skeletons are quite small. Child size, in fact. It would appear that the super mutants have been slaughtering and feasting upon the flesh of harvested children. And strangely, in here, in Murder Pass, there is also a terminal which has a shattered screen, but has a piece of paper placed inside of the broken screen with the word vault and an image of Vault Boy on it. While I'm not sure what this is meant to represent or mean, if it is meant to represent or mean anything, it is the only one in the game and curious nonetheless. Oh, okay, so the famed and loved Mysterious Stranger is a perk you can get where every now and then, like a guardian angel, the Mysterious Stranger will appear from nowhere and blast your enemies away with his 44 Magnum like some kind of guardian angel. Well, this concept is actually derived from an unfinished Mark Twain novel called The Mysterious Stranger, where the mysterious stranger claims to be Satan's nephew, and he also says that Satan was actually good and is just a fallen guardian angel. Strangely, in the Mark Twain book, the mysterious stranger refers to the Earth as 0 .44. 0 .44 would be a 44 caliber gun, which is the same caliber gun 
than the, the Mysterious Stranger carries in Fallout 3. And the Mysterious Stranger in Fallout 3 turns up every now and then like a guardian angel, just like the Mysterious Stranger in Mark Twain's book allegedly was. Oh, now these ones were hard to research, but they are from the Mystery Science Theater 3000. Firstly, in the Hubris Comic Books computer, there is listed a comic called Drake Tungsten, Chrono Cowboy. This is a reference to episode 410, Hercules Against the Moon Men, when Crow selects a new tough guy name for himself, which is nothing other than Drake Tungsten. And inside the National Archives, in the archival strong room on the terminal next to the Thomas Jefferson Protectron, the maintenance report is signed by one P. Bransteg, the guy in charge of fixing the robots. Well, this is a reference to Patrick Bransteg, who voiced Gypsy, one of the robots from the Mystery Science Theater 3000. And Patrick was also in charge of building and maintaining the robot puppets for the show, just as P. Brandstag here in Fallout 3 is responsible for maintaining the Protectrons. Also, while we're here in the National Archives, Button Gwinnett, the Protectron serving in the National Archives, says this. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. This line is actually a quote and the last words of Nathan Hale before he was hanged by the British in 1776. Now the slaver, Paradise Falls, called Ymir, takes his name from Ymir in Norse mythology, who was the father to all giants. Fittingly, his son Jotun takes his name from the race of Norse giants called the Jotun. So just as Ymir in Norse mythology gave birth to the Jotun, technically in Fallout 3, Ymir spawned Jotun, his son. We got any fairies? Because inside the sewer way station, on a conveyor belt, we can find a number of teddy bears in irresponsible positions, detailing debaucherous acts, smoking cigarettes, injecting meds, drinking whiskey, preparing grenades, brandishing weapons, and eating something delicious. And it's back to Dr. Zimmer. So there is a character called Armitage, who is Dr. Zimmer's bodyguard. It is well hidden, but soon discovered that Armitage is in fact a synth or android built by Dr. Zimmer. In turn, Dr. Zimmer controls Armitage, whether he knows it or not. Now his name is a reference to the 1984 William Gibson novel, Neuromancer, in which there is a character named Armitage who after suffering massive injury has a synthetic personality implanted. So the Armitage in Neuromancer is now controlled by another entity called the Winter Mute just as Armitage here in Fallout 3 is now controlled by Dr. Zimmer. There are also two other just as likely references to Armitage. One is the 1995's cyberpunk anime series Armitage 3, where the main character, Naomi Armitage, is an illegal Series 3 android. The other reference being to Jake Armitage from the 1993 SNES game Shadowrun, which was actually adapted from the original fantasy futurist TRPG Shadowrun released in 1989. Anyway, Jake Armitage in this is a cybernetically enhanced being, following the same themes as all the other Armitages involved here, but more specifically and importantly, Armitage in Fallout 3. Now all throughout the Capital Wasteland, we can run across electrical poles that have codes on them. Most of them just have random letters like this. A lot of them repeat, a lot of them are nothing. Well, all of them except for one are nothing of interest, but Outside Big Town, there is one pole that has a different serial number, TES-04. This, of course, stands for The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Bethesda Game Studios, the team that made Fallout 3, also made The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. And Fallout 3 actually runs on Oblivion's engine, so this electrical pole being a nod to that. Also, the pole's location is at the exact center of the map, which is likely a reference to the White Gold Tower from Oblivion, as it stands in the center of Cyrodiil, just as this pole, referencing that very game, stands at the center of Fallout 3's map. This one isn't that amazing, but the password to Moira Brown's terminal is MB3K OMFG. Oh my f***ing god. 
Ah yes, the Puppet Man. So in Paradise Falls, there is a unique Vault 77 jumpsuit. Now this is paying homage to the Penny Arcade comic commissioned by Bethesda that tells the story of the Puppet Man from Vault 77. In one part, Puppet Man encounters some slavers and the uh, Vault Boy puppet ends up murdering them all i.e. the puppet man is insane and killed a bunch of slavers. So along with this jumpsuit, there is also a holotape referencing this event. Like I told you, man, I don't f***ing know where it came from, but it freaks the boys out. Some story from a while back about a stranger with no name. Just get rid of the damn thing. Ain't no good gonna come from keeping it around. Besides, if it is his, maybe he'll come back for it. Comprende? Ah, uh, as promised, the Pepsi. So, the side quest and achievement known as the Nuka Cola Challenge takes its name from the Pepsi Challenge, which has been a marketing campaign of Pepsi since 1975. Now, the idea of Nuka Cola Quantum, as we talked about earlier, could have been a reference to Coke C2, but the idea of Nuka Cola Quantum being blue with questionable health effects is likely based on the Pepsi Blue variant, in which, upon its release, there were concerns that the dye used to make it blue would trigger allergic reactions of consumers. Also, inside the Nuka Cola factory on the research terminal, there is an entry that describes a new Nuka Cola flavoring that is coming. This is Nuka Cola Clear, with the same great taste as regular Nuka Cola. Now, this could be a reference to a number of things. Firstly, it could be a nod to Crystal Pepsi. This, of course, was just a see through Pepsi, because why not? It could also be based off of Coke Clear, which again was just a clear version of Coke because hey, why not? Or it could be a reference to White Coke, which sounds very suspicious, but it was actually a clear variant of Coca-Cola ordered to be produced and put into bottles without labels so it could be consumed by Soviet generals. Basically, this Soviet general loved Coca-Cola but he couldn't be seen enjoying a symbol of American imperialism, Coca-Cola, in his homeland. So he got them to make a new type of Coca-Cola that was see-through and put them into different bottles so no one knew it was Coke, but he could still drink Coke. And finally for the new Coca-Cola, we have its creator. We first hear about him in Fallout 3. His name is John Caleb Bradburton. Now his name is a Frankenstein's monster of Coca-Cola's inventor, John Pemberton, and Pepsi's inventor, Caleb Bradham, coming together to create Nuka Cola's inventor, John Caleb Bradburton. Now, deep within the Marigold Station, we can run into one Dr. Weston Lesko, who has been performing experiments on giant ants and has turned them into fire ants, which has since caused absolute mayhem for the surrounding area of Greenwich. Now, this character, Dr. Lesko, is a reference to the 1974 environmental horror movie Phase 4, where Dr. James Lesko is researching the sudden super evolution of an ant colony, where he hopes to combat them as they now pose a threat to humankind, just like Dr. Lesko's ants here in Fallout 3. Also, on Dr. Lesko's portable terminal access holotape, we discover that the access code to his terminal is 314159. This number is a reference to the mathematical symbol pi, which is 3.0. 14159, etc, etc. Point being, the code and pi is exactly the same with just a decimal point. Now you've definitely heard this guy, but the Enclave radio station, which is hosted by President John Henry Eden, who is a robot who is an amassed personality of previous presidents, well, him hosting his radio show is a reference to Fireside Chats, which was a series of 21 evening radio addresses given by US President Franklin D. Roosevelt between 1933 and 1944. This character, John Henry Eden, can also be noted for saying, The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Which is a line borrowed from the 1996 space combat game Wing Commander 4. The Price of Freedom, in which the character Admiral Tolwyn says this same line, The Price of Freedom is Eternal Vigilance. But even more interestingly, the actor that played Admiral Tolwyn, Malcolm McDowell, 
is the same bloke that voices the character John Henry Eden here in Fallout 3. So he's cross-referencing lines from characters that he has played. Now during the unmarked quest called Jig's Loot, we'll have to find a series of three numbers. These numbers are 19, 53, and 113. This Jig's Loot quest is given to us by a guy called Prime. Interestingly, these three numbers, 19, 53, and 113, are all Prime numbers. Of course, the key to unlocking Prime's clues is Prime numbers. Unfortunately, the character Prime isn't exactly living up to his name. He is not in Prime condition. Now, during the Wasteland Survival Guide Saga questline, while Moira Brown is patching up the player after the personal injury subquest, she will say, Oh, I know it does, dear, but it's for a good cause. Uh, try not to squirm so much while I take notes. Now, how would you describe the pain you're feeling? Any advice for how to keep it from being overwhelming? And remember, this is for posterity. This line is taken from the 1987 film, The Princess Bride. During a scene where the protagonist is being tortured, he is asked by the antagonist to describe the pain, cherried with the, and remember, this is for posterity, just as we experience here in Fallout 3. Now in Vernon Square, there is a movie marquee, where we can see the advertisements for a bunch of different movies that were in, uh, you know, fictional pre-war Fallout. But there's one here called P.S. I Hate You, which is a cheeky twist on the 1981 movie P.S. I Love You. Now, like many things, throughout Fallout 3 and throughout the Wasteland, we can run into these Pulowski Preservation Shelters, which are coin-operated one-person Fallout shelters, and yeah, they're as bad as they sound. Oftentimes, didn't help anyone survive. But uh, did you know that these Pulowski Preservation Shelters get their name from the real-life survival story of Edward Pulaski and his team of firefighters who survived a great fire by sheltering inside an abandoned mine. Sadly, the Pulaski survival trait did not translate over onto the Pulaski preservation shelters in Fallout 3. Now in the Fallout universe, there is a brand of radio and television called Radiation King. There is even a Radiation King store in downtown DC. This brand gets its name from the TV that Homer Simpson had as a child, which was called the Radiation King. Of course, from the show, The Simpsons. Now all around the place, we can find various propaganda posters, but the Civil Defense Administration poster in particular has been based off of a real-life Soviet Red Army recruitment poster, as is made clear with them side by side. Once again, dotted around the wasteland, we can find a diner called Dot's Diner. It's basically just a chain of diners but it actually gets his name from the CGI animated action adventure series reboot where there is a diner called Dot's Diner located in the city of Mainframe. Ah uh, yes, so in the Arlington Cemetery there is a house called Arlington House, which is a real building, although the one in Fallout looks nothing like the one in real life. Interestingly, out the front of the steps of the house, we can find a dead regulator, where on its corpse we can find a contract to bring a raider to justice. This raider can be found inside the Arlington house in the basement, where we will bring him to trial with a trigger. So what we've got is a regulator hunting a raider within the confines of a Civil War history building. This is especially interesting because at the Confederate Andersonville prison during the Civil War, there was a band of rogue soldiers being held prisoner there who were called the Raiders, and they caused so much trouble that eventually an internal force called the Regulators was created to put a stop to the Raiders and their mayhem. Exactly like what we find here in Fallout 3, Regulators hunting and bringing to justice Raiders. In this basement there is also a really creepy shrine to Abraham Lincoln. Nothing more to it just thought I should point that out. So there's a companion you can get called RL3. He can be found just outside the Robco facility, and he's a Mr. Gutsy, therefore we know he's a badass. And he can be caught dropping this line. Old war bots never die, we just rust away. This is a reference to General Douglas MacArthur's quote from the 1951 farewell address to the US Congress in which he was interrupted by 50 ovations. Towards the end of the speech he said, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Something that evidently applies to Mr. Gutsy's as well. Now RL3 can also be heard saying, there's nothing I like better 
better than making some other poor bastard die for his country. Ready to die for your country? This is based on a quote from the American General George Smith Patton Jr., which was the object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other bastard die for his. And ever so fittingly, the name of this hardcore military character, RL3, very closely resembles the initials of the actor and former drill instructor, R. Lee Ermey, his initials being RLE. Of course, in internet culture, a three can often replace an E, so RLE, RL3. So R. Lee Ermey, you'll probably know best for playing the senior drill instructor, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman in Full Metal Jacket. And he has since played roles and voiced many characters which require a hardcore military attitude. So again, a super fitting that RL3's name appears to be based off of RL Ermey. The 2006 novel, The Road, written by Cormac McCarthy, influenced some elements of Fallout 3, as Todd Howard stated in an interview about Fallout 3. While most of the influence drawn from The Road was tonal, we can come across some hunters selling strange meat, aka human flesh. What do you need? Well, sure. We've got plenty for the moment. Give me a shout if you need anything else. <laughs> the very best kind. Try some. You've never tasted sweeter, I'll warrant. This appears to be based on the trope of the hunters from the road who hunt humans for their meat. Funnily, inside the Robco facility, if we head into the bathrooms, at the end there is a toilet stall within which is a Protectron sitting on the bowl, busting out some nuts, which is actually quite literal, as if we look in the bowl, there is a bunch of scrap metal, nuts and bolts, bits and pieces. I guess this guy just had a bit too much spicy fusion battery last night. Eh, this guy definitely needs some more fiber in his diet. Fiber optics, that is. When creating a female character, there is a haircut style called Wendy the Welder. This takes its name from the Rosie the Riveter, a model for working class women during World War II. And there is an actual famous photo of a young woman, which is titled Wendy the Welder. Was this haircut named after the specific photo of Wendy the Welder? I doubt it. I think in general the gist is it retains femininity, yet is practical and gets its name from the general movement that Rosie the Riveter inspired. This one's pretty cool actually, inside the gold ribbon grocers. When we enter, we'll notice something is awry. It would appear that the entire shop has been set up as a Rube Goldberg machine. These are contraptions which basically take the concept of dominoes to the next level, where elaborate mechanisms are set up. When triggering one, it triggers the others and the others and so on. The best way to describe one is to set this one off. Not bad. It was fun to watch and we got some loot at the end. I like it. Ah oh yes, now heading back to Vault 92 where we went earlier. This again was the vault where many prevalent and talented musicians and artists were invited to live so they could preserve music and art in the wake of nuclear annihilation. In here, the overseer was named Richard Rubin. This name is a reference to Rick Rubin the real-life American record producer and former co-producer of Columbia Records. So just as he deals with the musicians in real life in Full Art 3, he's also overseeing them. Similarly, there is a documented resident of Vault 92 called Gordy Sumner. This is a reference to the well-known singer and songwriter Sting, as his birth name is Gordon Sumner. Again, on the same path, there is a character called Zoe Hammerstein, or Hammerstein, who gets her name from the Broadway lyricist and songwriter Oscar Hammerstein II. When Night Captain Dusk is asked what she does for the Brotherhood, she will respond with, I'm a sniper with the pride. Put any mutie bastard within one mile of me in my rifle and, well, pack it up troops, fight's over. Colvin thinks he's a better shot. Man's delusional. This line is taken from the 1998 war film Saving Private Ryan, where Jack says the same line only about Hitler 
and not a mutie. Again on the same line when Knight Captain Gallows is asked what his real name is, he responds with, What's the pool up to now anyway? Nice try though. This once again is a line taken from the movie Saving Private Ryan, which is said by Captain Miller to completely break the tension of a very serious situation and basically sidetrack everyone involved, which is exactly what Knight Captain Gallows is trying to do here when we ask about his name. Now under a bridge and seemingly in the middle of nowhere, there is a strange building simply called Shelter. Inside here, there is a room which I'm not actually sure what it references, if it does reference anything, but it's filled with plungers. There is a garden gnome with syringes all through its head. There is a mannequin with plungers on its head. There is a medical bench with a man made out of plungers. But very, very strangely, there is a series of bloody handprints and a series of plungers making its way up the wall, which if we follow it, we will see that whoever did this actually made it to the ceiling. But then if we follow where the trail ends down to the ground, we will find the skeleton. Someone went full ninja and plungered their way up a wall only to uh, take the plunge and end up dying. Again, I don't know if this room is a reference to something, but it's so weird I had to put it in. Also, when we walk in, right next to the doorway, there is this strange pile of stuff balancing, which you'll notice is really impressive when you realize that this book is being held up by pencils standing upright. Ah, uh, now the character Uncle Leo, who you run into randomly, is named after the character of the same name from Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld's uncle, Leo. As Uncle Leo in the show kind of pops out of nowhere every now and then, you don't know when to expect him. You run into Uncle Leo in Fallout 3 as a random encounter. Again, you don't know when you're going to run into him. But also, a character of the name Uncle Leo has been a common theme throughout Bethesda's games in the past. Again, reinforcing that Uncle Leo is a reference to Seinfeld, that dude that just rocked up out of nowhere. After you complete the Galaxy News radio quest, Three Dog shouts, People of the Capital Wasteland, you can hear me! You can't stop the signal, baby! This line is taken from the 2005 science fiction film Serenity, said by Mr. Universe when talking about, you won't believe it, a signal as Mr. Universe broadcasts the truth, whether pleasant or not, and this is similar to what Three Dog is doing as he's fighting the good fight. So as soon as we come into the Museum of Technology, on this massive curved desk in the foyer, we can find an interesting arrangement of pencils and a bottle cap. This is actually the logo of a gaming news website called Shack News. Apparently, someone at BGS was enough of a fan to painstakingly build this out of pencils. Now inside the Tenpenny Tower, when it gets sacked, it sure looks like a creepy abandoned hotel. Well, in one of the hallways we can find a red tricycle, along with at the other end of the hallway, bloodstains on the wall and a chair. This is of course a reference to the classic 1980 horror film The Shining. In particular, the famous scene in which Danny rides his tricycle through the hallway around a corner and runs into the twin girls. As they speak, there are flashes of them laying on the ground murdered next to a chair, just as we find here in Fallout 3 with the blood on the chair and the tricycle in this eerie, creepy, abandoned hotel and this long hallway. Now during the quest The Replicated Man, we can come across a holotape called Self-Determination is Not a Malfunction. I want to live my own life, on my own terms, as my own man. I used to work for the Synth Retention Bureau of the Commonwealth. But I'm done with that life. I'm through with being someone's property. I am not malfunctioning. Since when is self-determination a malfunction? This holotape name and its contents are a reference to the 1986 film Short Circuit, where a robot is struck by lightning and gains a more human intelligence and philosophizes the phrase, life is not a malfunction. The film Short Circuit also deals with the same concepts as the Replicated Man Quest does, an artificial being challenged by self-awareness and free thinking consciousness. Now inside the Germantown police headquarters, there is a 9-11 dispatch terminal that has logs of calls made. One of the quotes is, and that's how you get to the Llama School. This is actually a reference to a song from the MTV, sock puppet talk show called Syphil and Ollie. That song from that show being called, 
the Llama School. And also, in this same building, the password for the lockdown computer is Vicious Koi. Now, on the Syphil and Ollie show, there was a character called Precious Roy. But there was also a kind of alternate dimension Syphil and Ollie show called the X and O Show. And the X and O Show's version of Precious Roy was Vicious Koi, the password we have here in Fallout 3. Inside the Lady of Hope Hospital, there is a large open room, and if we look up, we'll notice a skeleton and a barrel hanging out of this opening in the ceiling. Well, if we shoot the barrel, this will happen. A stack of skeletons and random other rubbish and trash falls out of the hole, but funnily, the last two skeletons don't fall down, as one is caught at the last second by his mate, grabbing his ankle and saving his l marrow? Death? Can you save a skeleton? I don't know. But this skeleton friend saving his other friend from falling. It's quite quaint. Every now and then on the radio, you will hear three dogs say this. If you do need to head into the heat, be smart. Give yourself a nice boost of rad X first. Remember, only you can prevent human flesh fires. This line is referencing Smokey the Bear and his famous PSA slogan of only you can prevent forest fires. It's just been falloutanized into uh, flesh fires. Ah, oh, now this one's cool. So inside the Capitol Post building, down in the basement, we can find one unfortunate chap. His name is Gibson. His head has been cut off and lays at his feet while his body is slumped up against a wall. This scene is a reference to the 1988 cyberpunk-themed game Snatcher where a minor character named Gene Jack Gibson is found dead with his head cut off and lying between his legs, just as we find Gibson here in Fallout 3. However, the similarities don't end there. So both Gibsons also carry a note on them that simply says, search the house. So if we take this key and actually head to Gibson's house in Minefield, inside his actual house will be a small model house, which is the house mentioned in the note and will contain random loot. But going back to Snatcher's Jean Jack Gibson, he also has a model house which contains clues. And there are also two other houses in Minefield named after characters from Snatcher. Gillian House is referencing the character Gillian Seed, the game's main character, and Benton House is referencing either the character Harry Benton or the character Benton Cunningham. Both are as likely as one another. All in all, a really solid reference to an old school classic Snatcher. Now going back to the Museum of Technology really quick, interestingly, they have on display the lunar module that first landed on the moon in Fallout's universe. Now as you may know, Fallout's universe diverges from our universe before the moon landing took place. And curiously, despite the Americans being the first to land on the moon within the Fallout universe as well as real life, the lunar module that did it within Fallout is actually based off of the real life Soviet LK lunar landing module, rather than the actual NASA LEM. I don't know why they did this, it's quite curious, I suppose the Soviet LK fits the aesthetics more for Fallout. Ah, uh, we had to get her at some point, Star Trek. So during the first fade to white in the opening character creation, basically as soon as you're born, it will fade to white, and if you listen really carefully and quite closely, we will hear the line, damn it, we need a doctor, not a scientist, or not a dentist, or demunist. I'm not actually sure what he says, but the point is, damn it, we need a doctor, not insert whatever profession. We need a doctor, not a dentist. So this is a reference to the common phrase said by Leonard McCoy in the original Star Trek series, where given any situation, he had to do something, he'd say, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a insert relevant profession for given situation. And this has been super subtly slipped in right to the first fade to white at the character creation. Similarly, in Rivet City, if you try and buy chems off of Dr. Preston, he will say this. You can get that crap down at a quick fix. It's in the market. I'm a doctor, not a dealer. I'll fix you as best I can if you're hurt. This is of course borrowing from the same trope that we just spoke of. Now as we discover in the Hubris comic store, there is a comic book and TV character called The Adventures of Captain Cosmos. This TV series is due to air at 8pm on Thursdays. 
Now given the time slot and the overall space exploration theme, it would seem that The Adventures of Captain Cosmos is based off of Star Trek as it's thematically similar and Star Trek was originally aired at 8pm on Thursdays, just like The Adventures of Captain Cosmos. Now inside the Nuka-Cola plant there is a shipping computer, the password for which is That information is in the shipping computer terminal. Passcode for the terminal is NCC1864. NC dash C1864. This seemingly random string of characters is actually the same call code for the USS Reliant from the 1982 Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Ah, inside the Citadel, there is a Mr. Gutsy called Sawbones who works as the Doctor. He greets you with the phrase, Please state the nature of the medical emergency. This is the signature line of the Doctor from Star Trek Voyager that he says whenever he appears. And Sawbones can also on rare occasion be found writing poetry, which is something other Mr. Gutsies would never do, much like how the Doctor would perform artistic pleasures unlike other holographic counterparts. Oh, this one's good. Okay, so the Brotherhood of Steel member Redden is an initiate that will die during the quest following in his footsteps. Funnily though, her script is called MQ01 Red Shirt Script. Well, what does that mean? Well, Red Shirt is in reference to a term used in the Star Trek pop culture to describe expendable characters, i.e. the guys in the red shirts in each episode were probably the guys that were going to die while out on a mission. Again, they were expendable characters. And this is exactly what happens to Redden. She is introduced only to be swiftly deleted from existence by the brutal slam of a super mutant behemoth. Because she fits the red shirt trope. So someone at BGS added that into the name of her scripting, MQ01 Red Shirt Script. Now at the city of Megaton, atop the gate, there is actually a sniper keeping an eye out for any wrongdoers or trouble causes. His name is Stockholm, and sadly, we can't actually interact with this guy because we can't get to him. There's no way to get up here, and he knows that. As if we use console commands to get up onto his perch where he watches, he will say this. The more time I spend talking to you, the less I'm spending watching for raiders. How the hell did you get up here anyway? Bethesda gave this guy unique dialogue referencing how the player would have had to have used console commands to get up here. But I mean, come on, someone has to come say hi. We wouldn't want him getting Stockholm Syndrome. Mmm, the famous and incredibly nutritious sugar bombs that we all know within the Flood universe actually came from a daily cartoon strip by cartoonist Bill Watterson called Calvin and Hobbes, in which Calvin's favorite breakfast cereal is the familiar sounding chocolate frosted sugar bombs. Hmm, I wonder where they got the idea for sugar bombs from. Oh, we're going back. Inside the Hubris Comics building, we can find the receptionist's terminal. On here, there is a release schedule section where it lists an upcoming comic called Captain Cosmos, Truth, Justice, and the Space American Way. This name has taken influence from Superman's famous catchphrase, Truth, Justice, and the American Way. Also based on Superman is the icon for the toughness perk. As we can see, it is obviously modeled off of Superman. His costume is the same, with the same colors. There are various items seeming to be bouncing off his body while striking the classic Superman pose. And of course, Superman is tough. Similarly, the action boy slash action girl icons are also based on Superman, especially with the nerdy glasses referencing Superman's alter ego, Clark Kent, notable for his nerdy glasses. Again, the icon for the achievement Superhuman Gambit is also based off of Superman slash Clark Kent combo, and the Defender achievement icon is some weird hybrid of Batman and Superman merged into one superhero, Superbat. Ah, uh, so in the village of Annadale, the townsfolk will welcome you and treat you to their delicious strange meat. Meat, meat, meat. They love their meat. Hello again. Stick around for a while. I'm thinking about making some meat cookies later. 
Isn't that exciting? They're all so nice too. There is a dark secret though. This strange meat is actually human flesh. Yes, that's right. The families of Annadale hunt and harvest humans, butcher them, store their pelts, flesh and meat. But if we agree to keep their secret, every day we can get a strange meat pie off of Linda Smith. Oh, of course. Here you are. Enjoy. This is actually referencing Sweeney Todd in the Penny Dreadful story, A String of Pearls, in which a barber, Sweeney Todd, would murder his clients, but then Mrs. Lovett would harvest their flesh and bake their meat into delicious pies, exactly the same as what happens here in Annadale. Lovely Mrs. Linda Smith will cook up the flesh of the harvested into some yummy, yummy meat pies. Speaking of yummy, at the start of the game, during the birthday sequence that takes place within Vault 101, Butch will attempt to take your sweet roll. That bastard. Here you go, a nice sweet roll that I baked for you just this morning. And it's all for you. No sharing required today. I know you were joking, but I'm not sure anyone else did. I'm hungry, and that stupid robot destroyed the cake. Give me that sweet roll you got from old lady Palmer. This is a running joke or scenario throughout Bethesda's games, originating all the way back in 1994's The Elder Scrolls 1 Arena, where during a class determination question, a scenario is presented in which a gang of three kids your age approach you and the leader demands your sweet roll. Exactly as what we see here with Butch and his gang of goons trying to steal your sweet roll during your birthday party in the game's introduction in Vault 101. Ah uh, yes, so the T-Rex skeleton inside the Museum of History has three clawed fingers, whereas getting your nerd on, in reality a Tyrannosaurus Rex only had two clawed fingers, so get wrecked whoever built this T-Rex. There had to be one, but the icon for the cyborg perk has been based off of the T-101 from 1991's film Terminator 2 Judgment Day. As we can see, it is missing the flesh, revealing the cybernetic components beneath, in particular half of its face and one arm, just like the T-101 does during the film Terminator 2 Judgment Day. The style of the robotics is also similar to the said Terminator. Now the quest, those in which we clear out a bunch of mutated ants, takes its name and theme from the 1954 science fiction film Them, which is also about a nest of giant ants which have been mutated due to nuclear radiation and exposure, just like we find here in Fallout 3. Now going back to McCready, the leader of Little Lamplight, Mayor McCready, or if you want his full name, Robert Joseph McCready, or R.J. McCready, likely takes his name from Kurt Russell's character in the 1982 science fiction horror film The Thing. His character's name in the film is R.J. McCready, bearing the same initials and almost the same last name as Robert Joseph McCready here in Fallout 3. They also have similar personalities, not tolerating nonsense, rising to leadership and being resourceful survivors. Ah, here will come soft rains. Okay, so at the location known as Townhome, there is a house called the McClellan Family Townhome, where there live two parents, a baby, a child, a family dog called Muffy, and their family's Mr. Handy. We can find the Mr. Handy in a room with a terminal next to him. If we take a look, there is a list of general commands and chores that the Mr. Handy can do. If we select read the kids a poem, he will travel to the child's room, who was uh, totally dead by the way, and recite this. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound. And frogs in the pool singing at night. And wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one. We'll care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And Spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. 
This is actually a poem written by Sarah Teasdale in 1918 called There Will Come Soft Rains. Now this poem influenced Ray Bradbury to write a science fiction short story of the same name in 1950. There will come soft rains, which this entire family home in Full Out 3 is an allusion to. As is in the story, there is a house in which a robot continues to run a household after its owners have long perished due to nuclear war. The only surviving member in this story is the family dog suffering from radiation and starvation. The dog in the story perishes. And in Full Out 3, if we go out the back of the McClellan family household, we can find their starved dog, Muffy, who has passed, just like in Bradbury's story. Also, the name of this family, the McClellan family, is a name used for the family in another one of Ray Bradbury's stories, Fahrenheit 451. And the street name that the family house is on is called Bradley alluding to Ray Bradbury's last name. So all in all, an absolute egg-packed bundle we have here at this address. I'm sure we all know and probably love the character Three Dog, but did you ever know where he gets his name from? Well, the guy that voice acts for the character is Eric Todd Dellums, who starred in the 1986 film She Gotta Have It as the character Dog 3 which BGS took, flipped, and gave us our beloved Three Dog. At Paradise Falls, the slaver character Eulogy Jones has two slave women. Their names are Crimson and Clover. Their names together are a reference to the 1968 song Crimson and Clover by the band Tommy James and the Shondells. The song also appears to be about a woman or woman called Crimson and Clover. Ah yes, it's time. Now we'll take a closer look at Tranquility Lane and its many references. So the cult classic character, the pint-sized slasher in Full Out 3, is heavily based off of the clown that appears on the 1998 video game cover art for Khan Evil. The creepy face, the clownish costume, the colour scheme, and the slashy slashy knifey knifey all bear striking similarities. As Tranquility Lane is a simulation, it seems to portray the American dream at face value. Clean, safe, neighborhood. Green lawns, white picket fences, all that classic stock standard, simple, dreamy haze visions of everyday America. Because of this, it's very likely that the character Roger Rockwell gets his name from Norman Rockwell, who is best known for his Americana artwork on the covers of Life magazine from the 40s to the 60s, where his illustrations portrayed a simpler, purer time of America, much like what Tranquility Lane does. Now this one gets pretty confusing. In short, within Tranquility Lane, the simulation, there is a young girl called Betty. Betty is actually controlled by the overseer of Vault 112, Dr. Stanislaus Braun. There are fewer rules this time. I'd like to see just what you're capable of. I'd like you to kill Mabel Henderson. An old, sadistic, narcissistic, psychopathic man. He uses Betty within the simulation to torture the other people in the simulation purely for his own entertainment, even killing them only to resurrect them and torture them once again. Essentially, Betty plays God within Tranquility Lane. So Betty has been based off of a few things. Firstly, the concept of Betty was based off of the 1961 The Twilight Zone episode, It's a Good Life where a child born with godlike powers isolates his small town from the rest of the world where he torments and tortures and kills them at will, using them as his own personal playthings. Betty is also based off of the 1967 short story I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, in which a supercomputer called AM becomes self-aware and almost completely wipes out humanity, but keeps a small handful of humans alive only for the sake of torturing them. And the concept of Betty secretly being controlled by an older man is based on the 1965 science fiction novel The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, where while in a multiple person dream link, Palmer Eldritch takes the form of a little girl called Monica as to hide his identity and allow him to manipulate his nemesis Leo Blero 
within the dream. And the actual character behind Betty, Dr. Stanislaus Braun, is one of the oldest characters in the Fallout series, having been born pre-war. He was born and lived in Germany and was a fantastic scientist throughout his lifetime. Because of this, his name is likely drawn from a combination of Stanislas Ulam, who was a Polish-American mathematician who worked for the Manhattan Project, and Werner von Braun, who was a rocket scientist who worked for both Nazi Germany and the US. So all in all, a pretty crazy bundle of references there, but just to make it a bit more lighthearted once again, Weirdly, if we use the noclip command to go underneath the Henderson residence within Tranquility Lane, we can find a terminal under here. We can talk to it, but all it says is... Hey there. Later. Like some kind of lost soul in the simulation trapped inside a terminal under a house. Maybe it's a computer pretending to be human within a simulation of humans in computers. Yeah, it's all philosophically incestuous. Oh, now it's prime time, baby. So Liberty Prime, the massive robot that will crush everything in its path, has many lines, most of which are humorous. Democracy is non-negotiable. But this line... Freedom. Freedom is the sovereign right of every American. Appears to have been based off of a line said by Optimus Prime in the Transformers series. That line being, freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Despite the similarities between characters and the characters' lines, Emil Pagliara denied any intentional relation, although admitted it could have in fact been a subconscious influence when creating Liberty Prime. But I mean, come on, Optimus Prime, Liberty Prime, two giant robots that uh, save things and drop very similar lines. Anyway, Liberty Prime's head appears to be modeled after Gort's head, the robot from the 1951 science fiction movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. Their heads are very similar in appearance and functionality, as they both shoot lasers out of their single eye slot. Now, this one's actually really crazy. So Liberty Prime also throws nuclear warheads, which are kind of shaped like footballs, but he throws them as if he was playing NFL. This is a double entendre, as the phrase, the nuclear football, is the name given to the briefcase containing the nuclear codes, and the president in this situation is the nuclear quarterback, as he is the one that launches the nuclear football. So Liberty Prime is doing that in the phraseological sense and in the literal sense. He's literally a nuclear quarterback, literally throwing nuclear footballs. Now the faction known as the Railroad that helps free and liberate synths has been based off of the real life Underground Railroad which was a network of secret routes and safe houses used by African American slaves and abolitionists to help the slaves reach the free states or Canada. Now inside the Evergreen Mills Bazaar we can find a character named Smiling Jack who carries the unique shotgun called the Terrible Shotgun. He is actually a reference to a character from the 2004 game Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines, as there is a character named Smiling Jack who warns the player character of shotguns as they deal massive and terrible damage to vampires. Fittingly, Smiling Jack here in Fallout 3 carries nothing other than the terrible shotgun. Now the character, Lucas Sims, the mayor and sheriff of Megaton, sure has a solid cowboy vibe about him. He likely gets his name from the character, Lucas Sims, in the famous Western TV series Walker, Texas Ranger. Of course, both Lucas Sims share common equestrian cowboy traits. Now, like Mad Max, the 1988 science fiction post-apocalyptic game Wasteland has influenced Fallout in many ways, and was actually made by Interplay, the same company that created Fallout. Of course, this leads to a solid group of easter eggs in relation to Wasteland. Firstly, Brick, the heavy weapons expert that we saw earlier, says this. The other guys hate mapping this zone, but hey, I love it. I love turning the muties into a fine red mist with my gun. Now this phrase, fine red mist, is actually a pop culture trope originating from one of the descriptions 
for a dramatic combat deaths in Wasteland, where something would be turned into a fine red mist. So if you see that anywhere, just know it started in Wasteland. Now the faction that we spoke of earlier, the Children of Atom, they worship radiation, and it would seem they are based off of the servants of the Mushroom Cloud, who, just like the Children of Atom, are a religious cult of radiation worshipping zealots. The famous unique alien blaster, the Fire Lance, is named after the Martian weapon Fire Lance in Wasteland's metafictitious found in the paragraphs booklet that comes with the game. Also, funnily, occasionally on the radio, Three Dog can be heard saying, Hey, nice work, 101. Next time you're in the neighborhood, pop into the studio. Old Three Dogs toaster's been on the fritz. This is actually referencing the surprisingly useful skill in Wasteland, which of all things was the toaster repair skill. Now you know that quest with Moira Brown, the Wasteland Survival Guide? Well at the end you actually get the book, the Wasteland Survival Guide, which is named after the actual physical real life game guidebook that comes with Wasteland, which has the exact same name. The Wasteland Survival Guide. And President John Henry Eden, the AI president of Raven Rock, appears to be based off of Coach's AI mainframe in Wasteland, both being sentient AI supercomputers and both having similar motives in wiping Earth clean to start anew. When out and about, we can run into a character named Mad Johnny Wes. Well, this guy is actually named after. Wes Johnson, who is a prominent voice actor throughout many of Bethesda's games. Probably his most notable role would be the voice of Shil Gorath from Oblivion and Skyrim. And he's had a character put into Fallout 3 based on him, or at least named after him. I don't think he wears a minigun. Now inside Vault 101, the famed gang, the Tunnel Snakes, have a member called Paul Hansen Jr. He can be heard saying this. Because he's my pal. My brother. All us tunnel snakes are brothers. Birth to earth, womb to tomb. Mostly because tunnel snakes rule. Now this line, birth to earth, womb to tomb, is taken from the famous West Side Story, which basically also follows the life of young gang members and where that phrase or a version of that phrase, birth to earth, womb to tomb, is said as in like, gang member for life, we're brothers kind of thing. None of this West Side Story stuff is as cool as a tunnel snakes. So after completing the quest, the American Dream, and convincing President John Henry Eden to self-destruct, Three Dog can be heard on the radio saying this. I'm coming to you live with a special report. Ding dong, the sanctimonious, self-righteous, self-proclaimed presidential asshole is dead. This is a reference to a similar line from The Wizard of Oz, when the Wicked Witch of the West dies, and this song is sung in celebration. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch old witch, the wicked witch. You know the song. You yeah, probably guessed it, but the perk Adamantium Skeleton is a reference to Wolverine from X-Men. Of course, he has an Adamantium Skeleton, which is a fictional metal by the way, so the fact that it's in Fallout is a clever reference. Also from the X-Men sphere, sometimes super mutants can be heard yelling, WE ARE THE FUTURE! This is referencing a line said by Magneto about how the mutants are the future of evolution. Of course, X-Men, mutants, and super mutants both being mutants. So there's this unique Chinese assault rifle called the Xuanlong Assault Rifle, which is the best small automatic weapon in the base game. Now its name, Xuanlong, is actually, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but its name is given to black dragons in Chinese mythology, and they are one of five colors to be considered kings. So fittingly, a unique Chinese assault rifle that is the most powerful of its weapon class in the base game is named after the King of Dragons, or the most powerful dragon, Xuanlong. Similarly, in Chinese mythology, the mutant radiation bears called Yao Guai that you can run into have taken their name from Yao Guai in Chinese mythology, which means strange demon or monster. In Chinese culture, the Yao Guai are the manifestations of fallen divine creatures and the spirits of mistreated animals. A fitting name as the Yao Guai in Fallout meet that criteria, given they've been mutated and twisted by radiation. 
At the Arlington Library, we can run into a character called Scribe Yearling. Now her task is to go through the wasteland and collect pre-war books and texts to bring back to the Brotherhood of Steel to go into their archives. Now her name and her profession of collecting books leads to the conclusion that she has been named after Yearling Books, which is an imprint of Random House Publishing. Books, Yearling, one plus one equals two. She's named after this book company. And I've saved a really thick one for last. In the Wasteland, there is a town known as Erfu, where we can pick up a quest called Blood Ties. Now, nearby Erfu, underneath the Mariseti train yard, we'll be led to a faction known as the Family. For anyone unaware, the Family are a group of self proclaimed vampires. Now the family is likely a reference to the antagonists in Charlton Heston's 1971 film The Omega Man, where a nocturnal breed of pale vampiric mutants that live underground refer to themselves as the family, exactly like we see here in Fallout 3. Also, Robert, a member of the family, is likely a reference to Robert Neville, from the same film. And interestingly, when speaking to Karen in Erfu, she will mention that all they do is terrorize us. They taunt us to open our doors, throw bottles at our houses and scream at us. If I knew King had my back, I'd step outside and show them just how I feel about their visits, especially after this last attack. Now this description is the exact same as the behavior of the vampires described in Richard Matheson's 1954 novel, I Am Legend, which is the book that the Omega Man film is based on. So that's definitely interesting. Now the family, these self-proclaimed vampires, definitely have a lot in common with vampires. Firstly, when we find the West's dead, their corpses have bite marks on the neck. Now the one unaffected family member of the West family, Lucy West, is a direct reference to Lucy Westenra, who was a vampire from Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula. Both Lucy's also share similar pasts. And keeping with the vampire theme, the password to get into Ian's room is Vespertilio, which is a genus of bat. Needless to say, bats and vampires are often connected in folklore. Underground in the train yard where the family is found, You'll notice that their base is on the red line. Red, eh? The color of blood. Now, the name of the station that the family lives in is Mariseti Metro Station. But this actually gets its name from a commune in Hargita County, which is part of Transylvania in Romania. Romania, and specifically Transylvania, is Dracula country, which we'll get to in a second. Like right now, as Erfu, the town that led us to the family, gets its name because a road sign that once said careful has worn out. Ironically and unintentionally a warning sign for the encounters to come with the bloodthirsty The Family. Even more interestingly though, in real life, Erfu is also the name of a town in Romania, a village most notable for its close proximity to Bran Castle the same castle that featured in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion Easter Egg video. But for anyone uneducated on such topics, Bran Castle was famously at one time home to Vlad III, also known as Vlad the Impaler and Vlad Dracula, as he was the second son of Vlad Dracul. So Vlad III and his very dark, torturous, cruel goings-ons and his patronymic name Dracula are believed to have inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula and therefore all modern iterations of the fictional vampire Dracula or any of these kind of Dracula type things. So all in all, the family shares a lot in common with Dracula and classical vampire themes. And with that, I think we've just about sucked all the blood out of Fallout 3.
And there you have it ladies and gentlemen, I've been Camel and this has been my easter egg video for the base game of Fallout 3. I do hope that you thoroughly enjoyed it and you learnt something new about this awesome post apocalyptic game. If you do know anyone who would like this kind of content be sure to share it with them, it would mean a lot to me. Please leave a like, leave a comment and if you'd like to see more videos like this one please subscribe. It helps me know that people are interested in these kind of videos and will result in more of them. My other easter egg video links can be found down in the description along with links to my social media. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram and if you'd like to support the channel in a more personal way you can become a heroic patron on Patreon or a sponsor right here on YouTube. As I'm sure you know all of my time, literally all of my time and energy goes into making these videos I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So feel free to check out the playlist on screen, thanks for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and I will see you in the next video. I'll see you there soon.